Good morning, everyone. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm coming to you from Regina, which is located on Treaty 4 territory. Mass's work and support reaches lands covered by Treaties 2, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 10, currently known as the province of Saskatchewan, comprised of the territories of the Nehawak, Anishinaabeg, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Métis, and Nakota nations. We respect and honor the treaties that were made on all these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and we're committed to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous nations in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Welcome everyone to today's community chat. I'm Amber Hanover. I am the community engagement lead here at Mass. For over a year now, we've been holding bi-weekly virtual community chats connecting museum folks from across the province for personal professional development presentations. You can view the, view the full lineup of upcoming presenters on our website. I'll put that in the chat here and all of our previously recorded chats are available on this YouTube channel. Today, I'm introducing the presentation, Museum Worker Burnout, More Than Self-Care for Survival. Welcome to everyone, our mass staff and Paul Thistle. There will, will be a video presentation following our introductions. Thank you, Paul, for being with us today. Paul Thistle has 26 years plus of paid experience as a line worker and manager at large and small museums and archives in five different jurisdictions. He has taught museum studies and courses for professional museum organizations. For 30 plus years, Paul has been researching, writing, and advocating for improved working conditions in museums. Paul will answer any questions you may have following the presentation. And at this time, Paul, I'll hand it over to you. Sorry, Paul, you'll have to unmute again. I will uh, start with uh, acknowledging uh, the uh, where I am and uh, once I get my screen share, there we go. Uh, I am in Southwestern Ontario, a white settler born and raised here and now retired in the same location, a traditional territory of the Adirondack or neutral uh, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee. Uh, I appreciate uh, the uh, acknowledgement process, but uh, I think it's also important to commit to reconciliation. Uh, currently, I'm, uh, uh, or I just recently, I've been involved in encouraging museums to develop their own exhibits on Indian residential schools, and I'm currently. Uh, organizing a course at my church on uh, reconciliation. So uh, I'm going to start by saying uh, warning, warning, warning. Uh, I'm not sure where uh, that actually comes from, but I think it came from a movie. Uh, but I've been told uh, by uh, an anonymous reviewer uh, of something that I was writing. He sounds angry. Uh, I believe my anger is righteous, but I will leave that uh, to you folks to decide, okay, is he just uh, an angry old man uh, or is he justified in what he's saying? So what's the problem? I believe that there is a uh, a white elephant in every museum workspace. Uh, and uh, there's another problem here. There's only one woman uh, around the table here, but uh, when I was working in the Paw Manitoba at the uh, Sam Waller Museum, uh, I was involved in a $1.7 million capital project to move the museum into a provincially designated historic site. Uh, my the town council, who was my employer, wouldn't let me hire any more workers to help uh, me prepare for that. So 
uh, I applied and got uh, the museum uh, advisor uh, position in Northern Manitoba. Uh, and so what I did once uh, we started that was I visited uh, uh, as many of the museums in the region as I could. And uh, one of the places I went was the Ole Johnson Museum at Big Woody, Manitoba. Small museum. Uh, they, they, he, he was, Ole Johnson was an inventor. And so of course they were promoting his, uh, all of his brilliant things that he had developed. But you can't see the eyes of these ladies. Uh, we were waiting for lunch uh, put on for me, uh, for Bruce. He was outside finishing up one more job before lunch. Uh, their eyes showed uh, frustration, disappointment, exhaustion, and they could not find more volunteers. So these people were burnt out. And when I got back after my circulation, uh, uh, I was writing a, uh, a newsletter, a bi-monthly newsletter. And so uh, number 38 in August, 1990, uh, I stated at the end, there was however, one striking commonality among the variety of museums that I had visited among paid staff and volunteers in nearly every situation. And the similarity was burnout. Uh, recently, I've been, uh, I, okay, World Health Organization definition of burnout, which I appreciate very much. Uh, it's new in their uh, international classification of diseases, and they refer to it as a syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. The problem is management of the chronic burnout. So it's workplace stress that has failed to be managed. And in my view, it's not primarily a problem that has failed to be avoided or corrected by the workers themselves. Uh, the definition uh, of burnout, uh, the uh, psychologists uh, say it's emotional exhaustion, apathy, depression, variety of other negative symptoms such as loss of job performance. When you're burnt out, you're less able uh, to uh, do what's expected of you. And uh, also the key in my view is typically burnout strikes workers who are committed to their work. And that's, uh, I'll deal with that in the next slide. So burnout, uh, I really appreciate David Posen. He's a Canadian doctor who's been treating uh, bur uh, burnout at work for more than 30 years now. He's got a book that may be in your community libraries. It's called, Is Work Killing You? A doctor's Prescription for Treating Workplace Stress. It's the high ideals, high output of effort, draining of energy, fatigue, denial, and distancing. You may have been hearing that people are resigning from their, their jobs these days uh, because of the situation. Uh, originally, I developed a little diagram. Uh, the, the dotted line at the bottom there, the resources, they go up and down, obviously, and were grant directed organizations, we depend on grants. And so we become grant jockeys more or less successfully as time goes on, but the expectations go up. And I don't know whether you can see the one back, but uh, uh, I've done a presentation on this and the expectations don't go up on just a straight line. Very often they go up on a, on a, on a sharp curve. So what does that mean? Rising expectations uh, cause uh, what I call, what's, what are called, not just me, occupational devotees, task saturation. 
That means not enough time, tools, or resources to do what's expected of you. Time poverty. There's an organization in the States that uh, addresses time poverty and of course the resulting stress. The image there uh, is uh, something I developed for a poster I presented at one point. So we've got uh, an employee there and we want you to jump through this new hoop, uh, but we're not giving you a ladder so you can climb up there to jump through it. And then of course that uh, makes, we've got all these things coming up uh, and we're, we're time poor. And Dr. David Posen says that fluctuation, uh, that chronic stress syndrome line there, uh, the jagged line is healthy stress. Stress goes up, it motivates you, but you need rest, relaxation, and recovery. You, uh, and if you don't get that, that's what the, the problem is. Now, why do museum workers, uh, I believe museum workers are put, uh, particularly at risk of uh, this problem because we, we fall into a category that a sociologist identified as occupational devotees. We have strong positive attachment, it's self-enhancing work, sense of achievement, core activity is uh, intense appeal so that the line between work and leisure is virtually erased. That's a problem. We have high value commitment. We there's a profound love for the job, socially important, highly challenging, intensely absorbing, immensely appealing, and re rewarded by self-actualization. Now, do the folks uh, listening to me this morning uh, recognize themselves in any of those categories? I bet you do because it's the love for our jobs that puts us at particular risk for this problem. So my analysis, because of the exponentially increasing levels of expectations from visitors, uh, regulators, uh, museum, professional museum organizations that introduce, oh, let's introduce a set of standards for our museum community. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, and so there's the chronic lack of time, tools, and resources. And now, because we love our jobs, that gap between that line that goes up and the resources that probably are straight lined, we fill that gap by working longer, harder, and faster. And there's lots of evidence about that on my uh, blog. Now, Going back to the Ole Johnson folks uh, in, in Manitoba, uh, shortly thereafter, after my visit, the Association of Manitoba Museums was uh, uh, introducing a new set of standards. And I have uh, <laughs> uh, criticized that set of standards. It went through and uh, the Canadian Museums Association had uh, uh, looked at standards back in 1986, and they found that there were lots of uh, uh, concerns about uh, museums about uh, introducing standards. At the same time, Canada's new uh, museum policy had been introduced at that time, but there was no recognition of the burnout problem among museum workers uh, or of any understanding of the need to even look at that problem. Oh yeah, I uh, went to a conference in, uh, forget where it was, uh, Southern Saskatchewan in 1988. And in the loot bag, there was that uh, lapel button, standard, 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 standards, uh, different fonts. And so I thought to myself, hmm, that's an internal unintended critique of the set of standards that were introduced at the time. And we'll, we'll talk about that later. Now, what's the evidence? Uh, this, in my view, is a crucial understanding that everyone needs to, to, uh, to get to, to think about. Uh, Elaine Human Gurian uh, says uh, several years ago, even if impaired work performance 
uh, is not the outcome of unabated staff stress. There's a better reason to pay attention to staff needs. What is it? If our work in museums is evidence of our collective commitment to enhancing the quality of life for society, you know, uh, the American Alliance of Museums, museums can change the world, right? Then, if that's the case, we must be attentive to maintaining a high quality of life for our work community. And uh, the burnout problem is not new. Uh, Muse, the first edition of Muse, 1983, uh, David Newlands talked about role overload. Now, I flagged this one. Uh, I went to the Yukon in 1999, and uh, there was a document, the uh, Yukon System Plan. And the Lords, uh, Gail Dexter Lord and Barry Lord, had been up there and published uh, the report. What did they find? They find dysfunctional burnout. That's on page 111 of that report. And I've been using it ever since. And I flagged it because uh, I spoke at a conference with Barry Lord one time. Uh, there was a, a, a humorous thing in Muse about, uh, uh, you know, all the different things that come up in a day by a small museum person. Uh, the, uh, uh, the situation in the UK, it, the, the problems continues to grow apace. Uh, Canadian Museums Association and Human Resources, there's a risk of constant stress. Uh, Philippe Dubé, this man published an article in the 20, 2001 Muse. I've used it ever since. He, in Quebec, he actually did a survey in Quebec and found what? A general state of fatigue and burnout. Mercadex International found excessively heavy workloads, high performance expectations, multitasking, uh, Museum Roundup uh, publication in BC. Uh, she admitted to being a workaholic and volunteering many hours over and above paid hours and commonly 12 hours a day. Bob James, uh, museum uh, uh, executive directors are hopelessly overburdened. Uh, uh, there was a, a master's uh, research project done in, in, uh, in uh, Washington, uh, Andrea Mickelback. And not, mm, I'm not sure whether you pronounce it Mickelback. That sounds like Nickelback. But she, her thing was, are museum professionals happy? Uh, there's a worldwide organization called the Happiness Movement. And they're constantly measuring the levels of happiness, you know, like the, the Americans' life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, Andrea studied museum workers in Seattle. Look what she found. Museum workers are generally happier than the worldwide uh, sample, except in one element, and that's time balance. And uh, that is an important uh, perspective from my, from, in my view. Uh, recently, uh, Elizabeth Merritt, Trends Watch, uh, uh, 20, 2019, uh, she said in one of the chapters of her report, work is often exhausting, debilitating, traumatic. We often feel overworked, productivity drops, experiencing burnout, collections on contract uh, recently, uh, found that it's not only unsustainable, but it's also actively harming the field of uh, the field. Recently, uh, the BCMA bravely, in my view, uh, published a really disturbing study on museum governance. And uh, Willard and Bell, uh, the two, uh, Michelle Willard and Lorraine Bell, uh, reported many uh, executive directors of uh, small and mid-sized museums that they, they interviewed reported workplace stress, feeling burnt out, reported taking stress leaves and or leaving their positions. And that quote at the bottom there was uh, made by a, uh, a museum worker who had just finished a three month stress leave. And she said, I really 
felt I couldn't even bear to go back. And just thinking about going back after three months away made me physically sick. Uh, Borodenko, this is a recent uh, arts. There aren't many heritage workers in it, but look what happened with the pandemic. 26% uh, before the pandemic uh, in their survey saying, okay, we're experiencing uh, burnout. During the pandemic, 76%, that's a 192% increase in report of burnout. What's causing it? Uh, that's the thing that I worry about with self-care. Uh, if I have a broken leg, oh, I've got pain. So are you just going to give me opioids to deal with the pain? No, you got to fix the problem, the cause of the pain. And what is root cause analysis? It's uh, the seeking, defining, addressing, and managing the root causes of the problem to prevent it from continuing. And root cause analysis isn't a carrot underground. It's like a, a tree. I forget what you call those roots, but there's many causes. One of them is being an occupational devotee. Uh, but in my view, uh, it's management. And I've received a lot of uh, what should I call it, feedback. Uh, lots of people don't agree about me with this, but the Harvard Business Review says, research, uh, and that's 2021, uh, definitively shown that burnout is what? It's an organizational problem, not an individual one. Sanofi Canada, one of the largest healthcare providers in Canada, does an annual uh, survey. Uh, I haven't seen the one from last year yet, but in 2021, uh, they reported, we have to get at this now. This is dealing with burnout or else mental health claims at staggering levels are going to be the new norm. You may have heard the term, the great resignation not just in the museum business, <laughs> nurses in Ontario are resigning. Uh, Deloitte a few years ago, uh, Touche, they're the uh, worldwide risk management. We've got to think about risk management uh, with regard to burnout. Employers are missing the mark. Many are not doing enough to minimize burnout. And they should consider workplace culture, not just well being programs. Uh, and the people who look into this are uh, saying it's employer mismanagement of workers to the point of abuse. Uh, Willard and Bell in the uh, uh, BCMA uh, study report abuse by uh, boards. Uh, uh, there's been a longitudinal studies, 1991, 2001, uh, and 2011. I contacted the, uh, the uh, professor who's uh, dealing with this, Linda Duxbury at Carleton, and she told me, no, we're not going to be doing any another one in 2021, sadly. But look what they were finding. High perceived stress, 1991 to 2011, it's going up. High depressed mood is going up and high life satisfaction is going down. Can you imagine what it's like in 2021? Uh, now, getting back to that uh, highlighted uh, cause, uh, Barry Lloyd, Lord, uh, I uh, made a presentation of my uh, uh, little bag. 40th anniversary uh, museum, uh, Master of Museum Studies uh, anniversary conference in Toronto. And after my presentation, Barry Lord had given his, I can't remember what he was talking about, but he said in response to my presentation, as information workers, 
we in the museum field must expect 15 hour work days. I had just come back from a, a job in uh, Langley, British Columbia. I was being paid for seven and a half hours a day. Barry Lord wanted me to work twice as long as I was being paid for. That's a problem in my view. Uh, now, museum organizations have the same kind of idea. Uh, I was uh, going back and forth with the American Alliance of Museum uh, uh, Director of Museum Standards and Excellence on the lack of time balance at one point. She responded to me, we hear this concern repeatedly on our, from our members. However, there are still more people clamoring to work in museums than there are positions to accommodate them. Wait a minute. Okay, yeah, across the continent, let's build our museum railways and let's use all these coolies who want to replace the burnt out workers. And, you know, we can bury them uh, beside the track uh, when uh, they get too tired to, uh, to work anymore. Claire Mildrum, that is a key uh, post that uh, appeared on Exhibitrix in 2017. Uh, an, um, uh, an emerging museum professional who got tired of all the expectations and the low pay, and she moved on. She's working in the insurance industry or something. And there are lots of museum workers who have moved and, you know, are working for uh, museum suppliers now. Uh, and I was an aging museum professional. So uh, the AAM gives some career advice. They published this book in uh, 2012, A Life in Museum, uh, Managing Your Museum Career. And one of the chapters was, uh, as it says there, leadership at all levels. And it happened to be published in their museum uh, magazine. Uh, and there was a, uh, it was the oddest thing. I've I had never read, i have been reading museum for years. I had never seen uh, section headlines, subheadings in red letter capital letters. So they're screaming at us. And I used to uh, mark all my uh, hard copy journals coming in to me with uh, up arrows when I saw, oh, that's an increase in an expectation. So, uh, and there was a forest of those uh, things uh, in all my journals. And I, I can't remember any more than one down arrow. Uh, I'm not sure whether you follow Leadership Matters. Uh, but it's something that I follow. And there was, uh, a, a, last year, there was a, a post, how much lipstick can a museum pig wear? And Joan Baldwin says, uh, epic level of misunderstanding about a board's role, as well as poor onboarding, board members see their roles as an opportunity to behave tyrannically. It's exactly the same thing that Willard and Bell found in, in, uh, the in British Columbia. Poor compensation, okay, we get that. Defined, lack of defined, unmanageable workloads, micromanagement, uh, and cases of bullying, harassment, and sexism. When I came back here, where I'm living now, I talked to the art gallery director. She mentioned to me the board is treating her exactly the same way, misogyny. And they don't respect her because she's a woman. I was able to lead my boards around by the nose. I'm a man, but uh, no, women have much more difficulty and we've got to change that. I've heard from a museum organization executive director about uh, my issue. Like it or not, it's part of the new reality. That executive director had just told me about uh, 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 a leader who had committed suicide because of difficulties with the board members. Suicide. 
like it or not, he, he said, but that's the way it is. Uh, something I had written, uh, uh, the executive director of the provincial organization said, uh, oh, I, that I should tell you about my, uh, it's, uh, I used the, the idea, uh, the, the uh, straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, and we're, we're, museum workers are working, in my view, in a rain, a constant rain of straws. And we're, we're already fully loaded. Uh, and the executive director who is responding to my articles uh, said, uh, the variables are adaptability. There will always be straw. Uh, adaptability is strength. And the... Uh, so he's talking about training. Okay, yeah, we uh, train people and we can make them stronger. Stronger to do what? Carry more load? Uh, and the intended length of the journey. Man, the journey is never ending. Everybody knows that. And uh, more recently, I've heard, uh, I was proposing a, uh, a resolution at an annual general meeting to let's st let's start addressing this, folks. Uh, well, sorry, we don't have time to deal with a resolution like that. Uh, just recently, the, the uh, I saw uh, maybe it was in CMA listserv. Uh, the new uh, director of the Manitoba Museum, Dorota Blumzenska. She is a uh, she's involved in uh, worker rights before she got the job. And uh, she said, uh, well, I was facing uh, burnout and just thought to myself, okay, I need to practice self-compassion. Yeah, obviously. Uh, we need to prevent our own uh, burnout. But she was taking walks every morning and that kind of thing. And that's what was reported. Okay. Well, it's, it's all well and good, but my broken leg, we're not, we can't just give me opioids to kill the pain. We have to fix the causes. That's my point. And so the, I've got uh, lots of stuff uh, on this. Uh, now, what are the solutions? Uh, I follow, well, I'm a member of the American Alliance of Museums, and so I get all of their stuff, and they do this trends watch, uh, and I think I may have cited it previously. Oh, and I should say that uh, when I uh, uh, finish, uh, I'll be producing a PDF with all the links of my, of my references so that you can access them <laughs> if you have time. Uh, one time I was promoting something, uh, and one of my colleagues uh, uh, sent me an email and said, this is a great idea if I had the time. And what he was saying to me, it was just a one line uh, email. Uh, I don't have time to take care of myself. <laughs> I, I don't have time to take care of my own best interests. And that is a problem. And so I have a problem with self-care. I believe it's exactly what this uh, image says. It's not self-indulgence or it's self-preservation. And it's an act of political welfare. Warfare, sorry. Uh, and uh, that uh, trans watch, uh, the whole chapter was on self-care. After introducing it by saying, work is often exhausting, debilitating, and traumatic, but there's only one solution offered in that. Uh, and, you know, uh, okay, yeah, meditate, and yeah, exercise, good. Uh, and when are you going to do that? Well, uh, I imagine that uh, exercise is that on lunch hour. Uh, Joan Baldwin, who I appreciate uh, very much, uh, she organizes, uh, one of the organizers of the gender equality in museums movement. 
and sh at one point uh, they have a page, I think, on their website, five things you need to know about burnout. Uh, and uh, not immune to the fast paced, nonstop work culture that seems to be the expected norm. Full stop. The only thing suggested was self. We're suggesting more tasks that you should be doing for yourself. Well, thanks. Uh, for especially in this uh, this page, women you know have uh, uh, who are working in museums. They've got they've got children, and they've got uh, uh, anyway. Uh, nothing about acting to fix the problem. The first solution is on the desk of employers. Harvard Business Review. I, I may have quoted this before. Burnout is an organizational problem not an individual one. And I, I, I robbed this uh, for one of my uh, blog posts. Uh, and it says, uh, the, the, the image said, what do, you, what do you need to know about employee burnout? You need to do more than know about the problem. You need to do something about it. And uh, I appreciate what the Ontario Museum Association just published in one of their recent resources. Uh, they acknowledge the onus ultimately falls on the individual, but more importantly, employers need to better recognize the potential underlying issues within their workplace culture. And moreover, employers need to be responsive in a way that better addresses the issues. Now, okay, so here I'm suggesting one more thing that museum workers should do uh, for your own self-preservation. Uh, William uh, Urey is the director of the Global Negotiation Program. He, he, the power of a positive no. When you get a new expectation, that high uh, hoop that you have to jump through without a ladder to get up to it, you have to say, no, I can't do that. I have to take care of myself because if I get burnt out, I'm unproductive for you. And you say a positive yes to your own values and core interests. And then you negotiate and he gives a, a process you can go by. And David Posen's book, uh, my favorite source. I, I use it all the time in everything that I write. Uh, and he's got sec sections on how, what you do to uh, avoid and what employers should be doing and what employers should not be doing. For example, uh, the, I, I don't have a smartphone, but I know uh, lots, almost every museum worker probably does these things. Volkswagen, when they send their workers home, they turn off the company's smartphones. They've been doing that for years. Brazil has a law that says if a, an employer contacts a worker after working hours, they have to start paying them overtime. And I was, I was blown over. The Ontario government is now has a bill uh, that uh, proposing disconnecting from work rights. We have to disconnect. Willard and Bell found the executive directors on their days off were getting phone calls and the special events. They were going in and working on their day off. And with, uh, and there are lots of examples of them doing that without overtime uh, compensation. So I really appreciate this book, Wages of History, Emotional Labor on Public History's Front Lines. Uh, it, it was a, she worked in uh, Minnesota historic sites and observed what, what the working conditions were like. And she uh, had an input from one of the people she interviewed, one of the workers, 
and he was trying to organize a union. And he said, above all, above all, fight it now so that it doesn't plague you for the rest of your working life. We have to address this or it's, it's going to continue and we're going to lose uh, well-trained, enthusiastic, emerging museum professionals like Mildrum. They're going to quit. So uh, I, I've done this uh, four times at museum conferences, uh, brainstorming with uh, museum workers on how to, uh, to deal with the, the burnout problem. Uh, delegate tasks, uh, this is key, I think. You set a dangerous precedent when you do something heroic. At one time, uh, my manager arranged things. Uh, she, she, she sent away uh, my colleague. And so I had to take down my colleague's exhibit and put my own up. But I wasn't allowed to open late. So how did I, how did I do that? I worked. 32 days in a row of unpaid overtime. I came in on my days off and only worked eight hours on Sunday after I went to church. Uh, so uh, that's um, a big problem and I have experience there. Uh, the negative attitudes about museum workers who leave work on time. Let people leave work on time, please. Uh, and uh, at one of my sessions, every professional museum organization, it was at the CMA, needs to address it. It's a huge issue. It's a, it is a human rights issue. Make sure this becomes a governance issue on men and uh, personnel needs to be one of the main issues. Uh, and so there are lots of these in the document that I have online. So, uh, so there are lots of ideas like this. So collectively, it's not self-care that we need because we need to fix the causes, not just worker symptoms. We need to work collaboratively and uh, we're expected to have skills that analyze, create, create alternatives, act to minimize problems, value original process to problem solving uh, from the CMA. Uh, unionization is one of the things. There was a, an emerging museum professional, an EMP uh, Facebook uh, meeting at one point uh, recently, uh, and they were talking about unionization. Uh, my approach to unionization up till recent years has been, okay, I followed uh, this Joseph Ansel. He wrote uh, an article on the unionization of the Exploratorium. And he recommended the advantages of the staff associations. I uh, didn't think that that's a very good recommendation because one museum with a union isn't going to be effective, even if they are effective in dealing with one museum. So let's use the associations we all belong to. We don't need to unionize, which is a difficult process. We have national regional and uh, even uh, local uh, uh, museum associations. Let's use them. However, hmm, uh, I've been real unsuccessful persuading uh, museum organizations to deal with this problem. Uh, like uh, that uh, uh, professional organization director who, who told me, oh, we, we don't have time at our annual general meeting to discuss this. And that's the, the kind of reaction. So uh, we need to uh, take control of the organizations that belong to us. Uh, now there's a whole problem of whether these professional organizations are uh, working for the museums that belong to them or whether they're working as well as or equally for the workers who belong. I was surprised to hear I belong to the American Association of State and Local History. There are many more organizations that belong to the AASL 
than individuals. I was shocked. Uh, and so uh, we need to uh, direct our organizations to take action on museum worker well being. And let's address the culture of overwork. Let's even start a survey. I was unsuccessful in getting a resolution to do a survey about working conditions. Uh, training. We all go to training events, and I did it for years. And we pick up handfuls of straws at every training event. And when we get back to work, we put them on our, on our workloads. What we need to do as individuals when we're at these training events, okay, wonderful ideas that you want me to implement. How do I find the time, tools, and resources to do to implement what you're telling me I should be doing if it's new to me? Uh, and in my sessions, I've heard feedback saying we need to be able to drop just as many new tasks as you're giving me because I'm fully loaded already. Uh, now, collective action. Uh, there's a research going on at the University of Winnipeg by Davina De Roche. Uh, she's interviewed uh, former museum, art gallery, historical site workers. And the, her study is museum labor practices and collective action. I'm looking forward to that. So finally, uh, nothing comes Nothing worth having comes without some kind of fight. We've got to kick at the darkness until it bleeds daylight. So that's, I've talked at you long enough. And so uh, uh, you can uh, contact me on my uh, blog, uh, Solving Task Saturation for Museum Workers. And uh, that comes up as the first, well, maybe not the first Google hit, but it's, it's, it's findable. So I'm done. Thank you for your attention. And I'm going to mute myself. Well, maybe not. Anyway, are there questions? or comments. Well, uh, maybe I'll start it off. Um, I, uh, I've been very lucky in my working career, but it's dis disheartening uh, to realize uh, just how widespread uh, this, this problem seems to be. Um, I guess um, one of the first things that, that comes to mind for me is uh, maybe a question. I mean, I think this this kind of work situation is pretty common across um, not just museum, but you know, nonprofit and uh, sector generally. Um, well, I mean, maybe the working world generally, but certainly for non the nonprofit sector, there's a a different set of issues that's also uh, immediately springs to mind, I guess, which is the um, the limited funding that's already in place to sustain uh, the important work that that folks do, um, and and so I wonder if um, if you, you might have thoughts about um, how uh, addressing that larger situation where um, maybe there isn't you know universal uh, public agreement about um, what what the about the, the the levels of funding that are appropriate say. And uh, uh, the fact that we would all like to be able to do um, maybe more than we have the capacity to, and and that uh, the expectations, I guess, we, are not just things that muse museums, for example, put on themselves as organizations, but that this is maybe a broader uh, social expectation of what can be uh, done with uh, a certain amount of resources. Um, I don't, I don't know if that's making much sense, but uh, well, yeah, I mean, it makes perfect sense to me. Uh, I have been responding to those kinds of questions uh, with the following. Uh, we all have these 
museums very often, uh, when you're dealing with the board, you get all these new, wonderful ideas brought to you all the time. And every board meeting uh, a board member or a visitor comes in or you go to a museum conference. Yeah, we need to do that at our museum. But you have to be, and I use the term brutally honest about what you can actually do. Uh, because uh, things happen. Uh, at one point in my career, uh, we, you know, we developed all these objectives for the year and uh, we found that uh, the local river was going to flood and we, we were going to lose power. So we were forced to move our sensitive items into a, a place, another a museum that could control the, the, the climate for us while the flood was on. So those kind of thing happens. So you have to be flexible to say, okay, we're going to drop this. We can't fulfill that, that obligation. And we need to be extremely careful in our planning for the year. Because uh, so it, it, it's, I think museum people got to take off our rose colored glasses. And we've got to look at the real resources we have available. Uh, Bob Jane says, uh, we're never going to uh, get more resources. He says it's a bum's job trying to get more resources. And Julie Hart at the AAM said exactly the same thing in her response to me. There will never be more resources. So how do we deal with that? We gotta, we gotta deal with the other variables, our expectations, our plans. We gotta fit our plans to the resources that are actually available. Brutal realism is the answer to that problem. In my view. <laughs> I just have a question referring to uh, the area you were speaking of um, with, again, expectations, um, but again, the relationship of the organization or the leaders and those expectations being passed down to staff. Um, what are the recommendations for things like, um, you know, the stress to the ED from the board or even the staff and board relations that could become an issue and can lead to some of this workplace stress? Right. It's all about uh, relationships. It's uh, uh, the the uh, what do I want to say here? Uh, we all we're, we're working in the business because we think it's important and we love it. We we love doing what we do. Uh, I think we have to hang on to what everybody loves. Uh, actually, Willard and Bell in BC found that, uh, and the uh, other executive director I was talking to recently, uh, they, okay, well, here, I'm not sure how much time we have here, not much. Uh, we have to uh, best practices, museum best practices. We have to, uh, to implement those with the resources that we have. And we just have to uh, be realistic. We have to uh, sh make sure everyone uh, shares anyway i'm not uh, i'm not thinking very well so i'm not sure uh, i'll let me think about that and i'll put it in uh, one of the slides on the pdf i i put but i'm not able to be very 
Um, no, that's okay. I think it's just um, and making reference to one, you know, one of the statements or quotes you had from a book too is, or from one of the things was, uh, you know, not just the onus on the worker themselves, but taking, you know, responsibility at a board level as well. But again, that's like you, you stated at the beginning, answering this question, it's, you know, best practices. So I think, yeah. you know, that's, that's a good answer. And, you know, that information for sure, again, yeah, I think that, I think you answered it okay. Thank you. John Baldwin in that uh, kiss, uh, much lip, too much lipstick on the museum pig. Uh, her main point in that, in that article was that uh, museum directors have to spend too much time training board members. Huh. I disagreed with her totally on that point because that was my primary job. I, my job is to teach people what museums actually should be doing it and how they should be doing it. That's my primary job as an ED in my view. And, you know, uh, and I wrote, uh, I had a radio program to talk about back behind the museum scenes for the community. And I wrote articles in the local newspaper. This is why we do things this way in the museum. We have to teach our visitors, our, our politicians. Uh, in Canada, we haven't had, uh, during the pandemic, uh, the parliament, the days on the parliament. The Americans are doing that virtually, and they may even be doing it physically. Uh, we need to keep up that educating the politicians and the, the other decision makers and the people, the other people who we get all these right new ideas. It's the management by the next right idea, which is a problem in my view. We have to consolidate the last bright idea before we go on to the next. That's great, thank you, Paul. Um, does anybody else have any more questions? Oh, we have a question in the chat here. Oh, it's just a comment here. I'm not sure if everybody can see the chat. Um, it just says regarding all types of problems and solutions across the whole nonprofit sector, check out Nonprofit AF. So it's at Nonprofit AF on Facebook. Uh, the Ontario Nonprofit uh, Organization, uh, not Nonprofit Network, uh, has a decent work movement. The International Labor Organization has this. Uh, uh, movement going about decent work, but their decent work charter does not address the problem I've been talking about today. And I get no feedback from the I, the International Labor Organization and the ONN. Uh, I haven't been able to persuade them about the need for the right for people not to be overburdened in the in the charter but it's not in the international labor organization charter and it needs to be there does anybody else have any other questions or comments they want to make Okay, I will remind everyone that this is recorded. So if you do wanna see the presentation again and follow through some of those slides, again, Paul mentioned um, he will be submitting to me a PDF, which I'll put in our tips and resources area on our website, but I'll do a posting about that once I get that and that shared. Um, if you do have any other questions, um, you can send them my way and I can send them towards Paul or, um, direct you his way. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, keep in mind our next community chat, uh, we don't have a specific presenter 
scheduled, but we are going to do what we're calling map or sorry, mass radar. Uh, we'll be speaking more specifics about our call for presenters uh, that just came out for our mass conference 2022, as well as our upcoming and ongoing programs, courses, and all the things that we've been working on uh, for the new year. So hope to see you guys next week. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you again, Paul, uh, for joining us this morning and sharing all this generous information with us.